This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. The red state-blue state divide no longer exists, says political scientist Dante Chinney. But the great political divide is between suburbs and exurbs. Why should a president be allowed to serve only two terms? NYU professor Jonathan Zimmerman doesn't see why. He says the 22nd Amendment insults the American voter. And Bill Press talks with freshman Democratic Congressman Stephen Horsford of Nevada about the State of the Union Address. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. Follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Red State, Blue State, not a Dr. Seuss story, but a political narrative that Professor Dante Chinney says is out of date. The geographical difference between Democrats and Republicans lies not in the states, but in the suburbs and exurbs. And Democrats are winning that battle right now. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Dante Chinney is the director of the American Communities Project, a collaboration including the Wall Street Journal, PBS NewsHour, and WNYC Radio that studies politics, socioeconomics, and culture in a time of change. He is also the creator of Patchwork Nation, which won a 2009 Knight Batten Award for journalistic innovation and is the focus of the book, Our Patchwork Nation, published in 2010. Dante Chinney, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Well, thank you for having me. Indeed. You know, most political observers look at America as a collection of blue states and red states, but it isn't that simple anymore, is it? No, you know, there's really two problems with the blue state, red state uh, kind of breakdown. One is that the states are inherently kind of big and complicated. I mean, you, I grew up in Michigan, and as, as I like to say, there are a lot of different Michigans in Michigan. It kind of depends on where you are. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I really think is the blue and red. You know, we use blue and red as a as a way to kind of keep score on election night, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. We do have to have a way of keeping score. It's fine. But the problem is then it becomes shorthand for trying to understand uh, different places around the country. You know, and some places are can be equally as blue or equally as red for very different reasons. For you know, for instance, you could have an exurban area that is extremely red uh, in terms of its the the intensity of its Republican vote, and it, it looks the same as maybe a rural farmland. But those places are very different in terms of the culture, really, uh, the economy, and the socioeconomics are just completely different. Now, you have found that the divide between red and blue America does not follow state boundaries or even city boundaries, but the boundary between suburbs and exurbs. Is it a matter of population density that determines elections? Increasingly, it really does appear that population density is a uh, big driver of what happens politically. And there are a bunch of reasons for this. It has to do with um, what population density, how it has shaped these communities, what happens to the communities. And also, I think, uh, who has moved into them. You have people who used to live in near-in suburbs moving out more to exurban areas, and the people who do that tend to be more Republican in nature. And then the other thing is the the city, that's those, those suburbs that are left behind, these close-in suburbs, have urbanized in a lot of ways. And I think that's a big thing that's kind of pushed them to become more democratic. They look more like cities in a lot of different ways now. Of course, Democrats have always held sway in big cities, but now cities are also defined by their close-in suburbs. Is that good news or bad news for Democrats? I think for Democrats, that would probably be pretty good news. So what's happened is, <clears throat> as these suburbs have kind of taken on the the really the kind of general appearance and, and uh, definitely in terms of the, the data, the socioeconomics of them, they look more like, more like cities. That is, they have, they're very high on the uh, high end in terms of income on one end, but they also have a lot more poor now in these suburbs. They look more like cities in that way. What's happened with that, and as they've grown more dense, is they look and feel more like cities, and that has really expanded that area, like you say, the Democrats have always controlled the big cities into the suburbs. And uh, for Democrats, that's a very good thing. It's, it's uh, I think, overall, it, it just in terms, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the vote, the number of votes coming out of those places for Barack Obama, for instance, they really drove those near-in suburbs. Really drove him. Uh, really drove his victory. 
We're speaking with Dante Cheney, director of the American Communities Project, also the creator of Patchwork Nation. The suburbs themselves obviously have changed over time. Are they now suffering the same problems that we used that 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 used to define our cities, our inner cities? <clears throat> They're starting to. Yeah. Now, I still don't think you're getting the same. You're you're not getting quite the same kind of uh, polar polarization. I mean, economic polarization as you have in the big cities. But increasingly, yeah, poverty is becoming an issue in the suburbs. But I think the thing that, that what happens is we see poverty is increasing in the suburbs. We're like, oh, my God, the suburbs are poor now. I mean, there's still actually a lot of wealth in the suburbs. But they have taken on, they've taken on more of these, of these big city issues, have come out into the suburbs. And because of that, they, they again, it, it shifted in the politics in those places. And it's going to continue. I think uh, you're going to see kind of... Uh, the expansion of kind of the socioeconomics of cities into suburbs, you're going to see that continuing, I think, over the next uh, decade or so at least. So is that to say then that suburbs are now the main battleground between Republicans and Democrats? I would say that the main battleground between Republicans and Democrats now is now the the edge of the suburbs, right? So <clears throat> the Republicans really do seem to control the exurbs, the way we look at the American Communities Project. They control them by... Uh, substantial margins. They control in in 2012. They won Romney won them by about 16 percentage points, 17 percentage points, and then the suburbs, which are just outside of these big city counties, the counties that are kind of the near and suburban counties, Barack Obama won those counties by about 16 percentage points. So you cross some kind of line, and you really move from the suburbs to the exurbs, and that's where it flips. So there's this middle ground in between there that's that's still suburban and exurban really at the same time. That's really the Republicans and, and Democrats are fighting over moving that line back and forth. Who's going to control, how, how far do the Democrats push their suburban advantage out, and can the Republicans push their exurban advantage in? That's, mm-hmm. I think, the real battleground. Now, over the past, say, half century, urban northerners have moved to the Sun Belt, maybe just for the weather, but also because unions are weaker, taxes are lower. But as the population has moved south and west, didn't that make the Sun Belt more dependent on government services to accommodate the new people? I think in some cases you definitely see that. I mean, whenever you have an influx of population, right, what you need is what do you need? You need things like roads. You need things like schools. Uh, you, need things like, uh, you need things like transit systems. These are things you need to kind of make a, a growing metropolitan area function. You need more and more of those things. So, you know, more dependent, that's an interesting way of putting it. I do think that what you do see in those areas, in those Sunbelt areas, as these cities grow, these big cities become bigger and stretch out further, is a need in some way or another for more government services. And remember, this isn't always federal government services. This can be municipal services or it could be state services as well. But, yes, I do think there is an increasing need in those places. Mm-hmm. How long, if ever? will it take for Democrats to win in places like Texas, Arizona, Georgia? Well, you know, tech, they're, they're really different questions, right? If you look at Texas, this is what's really interesting, particularly about Texas, and I think Arizona also. What you have also, along with, I mean, the influx of Northerners that have, that have gone down there and Easterners, is you have this growing Hispanic population. And the Hispanic population is the kind of thing where it's going to – have a dramatically, the effect is going to be much bigger than people realize because those, the Hispanic population of the country is still very young. So it's aging into the voting age. And as more and more, as more and more Hispanics reach 18, you know, age into the, to the group where they can vote, you're going to see things happen very, very quickly there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's any place where you've got a large Hispanic population, which tends to be younger, as they age, you're going to watch changes happen very quickly. I think, again, that's though, uh, Texas, I mean, Texas, I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But you're talking, I think, 10 or 15 years. But look, the Hispanic population in the southern part of the state is just growing rapidly, very rapidly. And, and, and you know, again, those people are all going to vote. Those young, those, that young population, those kids are going to grow up and they're going to vote. And Republicans realize that. Uh, if they don't do anything to reach them, they've got huge problems. That's why they talk, at least some Republicans talk, about trying to do something about that. Others, don't, others are not really paying a lot of attention to it, and that's going to really hurt the GOP, I think, if, if nothing's done. And it's, it, yes, I was just going to, to bring that up, that this is, this is a huge growing part of the population. They are not engaging this part of the population. No. Uh, they're, 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 they're avoiding immigration reform at, at, at all costs. This is going to cost them, I would think, the Republicans. Yeah, well, this is the real concern for them. Look, um, 
if they don't do anything to reach this population, they've got a big problem. The, the problem is, particularly when you look at the way the House is divvied up, right now, the way Republican House members, not talking about the Senate, which is obviously different, but the House, the way those districts are drawn, the vast majority of those districts, or a large number of those districts, are white, very, very white, without a lot of Hispanics. And I think it, I, I looked at some numbers on this earlier, and if you look at, I think, the, the most recent Congress, the Hispanic population in those GOP House districts was about what the United States looked like in terms of the Hispanic population as a whole, what the United States looked like in the mid-1990s. So they're really representing a different America. They're representing an America that's like 20 years old now, 20 years in the past, I mean. And uh, so, so they don't see the need. In their immediate districts, they're like, well, I don't have a lot of Hispanics in my district. It's not really a problem. They've drawn these districts in such a way where if nothing is done, they, they've created a huge problem for themselves. And, th and look, some people in the party, in the GOP, really understand this, and they understand something needs to be done. But it's hard to convince those House members who have no need. They really don't see any need to do it. And also, those districts they represent, uh, they don't want anything done in a lot of cases because they view the Hispanic population as, as – uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to say troubles, but they view it as kind of an attack on their way of life. And uh, this is a real problem the GOP is going to have to sort out sometime in the next year or so. Or yeah. really, well, more than the next year, but sometime in the next couple of elections, they're going to have to figure that out. Right, because those lines are going to be redrawn. That's I mean, right. You know, and that's so interesting stuff. Dante Cheney is the director of the American Communities Project, also the creator of Patchwork Nation, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Dante, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to doing it again with you soon. Well, thanks for having me. All right. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Most second-term presidents, including President Obama, are shackled by the constitutional prohibition against running again. Professor Jonathan Zimmerman asks why voters can't keep electing a good president, like they did with FDR. And we'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Assume that you ran a business that was found guilty of bribery, forgery, perjury, defrauding homeowners, fleecing investors, swindling consumers, cheating credit card holders, violating U.S. trade laws, and bilking American soldiers. Can you even imagine the punishment you'd get? How about zero? No jail time. Not even a fine. Plus, you get to stay on as boss. You get to keep all the loot you gain from the crime spree, and you even get a $8.5 million pay raise. Of course, you and I would never get such outrageous, absurd, kid-glove pampering by legal authorities. But then, we're not the capo of J.P. Morgan Chase. America's biggest bank, and a crime syndicate that apparently is too big to jail. Jamie Dimon is the slick CEO who has fostered a culture of thievery during his years as a top executive at J.P. Morgan, leading to that shameful litany of crime. Yet, federal prosecutors have bowed to the politically connected Wall Streeter, refusing to ruffle his feathers with even a single criminal charge. Meanwhile, one of the scams that Diamond directly supervised produced a $6 billion loss for shareholders in 2012, and his reign of mismanagement and illegalities cost the bank's shareholders another $20 billion in federal fines last year, resulting in a 16% drop in profits. You might think the bank's board of directors would at least slap Jamie's wrist for the loss of those billions, but no. In January, they rewarded him raising his pay by some 70% to a sweet $20 million. This is Jim Hightower saying, The New York Times noted that, to ordinary Americans, such a reward for a poor performance, quote, may seem curious. Curious? Uh-uh. Try incomprehensible, insane, and immoral. Wall Street's haughty elites continue to demonstrate that they're common mobsters, only not so ethical. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you. 
the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Are American voters not smart enough to know whether their president should get elected again and again? Professor Jonathan Zimmerman thinks they are smart enough and argues cogently against the 22nd Amendment's two-term limit on presidents. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Jonathan Zimmerman is professor of education and history. Let me redo that. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Jonathan Zimmerman is professor of education and history and director of the History of Education program at New York University. He recently wrote a widely circulated op-ed calling for an end to the two-term limit for presidents. Jonathan Zimmerman, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, So... Does a two-term limit suggest that people aren't smart enough to know when a president is no longer useful? Well, that might be a little too harsh, but I think it does suggest a certain lack of trust in the voters, whether they're not smart or not, Um, uh, a certain lack of faith in their judgment. And indeed, when Dwight Eisenhower in 1956 made his statement against the 22nd Amendment, which limited him, of course, um, from running, you know, uh, more than, uh, you know, uh, more, more than once again, he said, quote, I've got the utmost faith in the long term common sense of the American people. That's Eisenhower making a plea against term limits. So I think that, that, that the point of the question, I think, is well-founded, that it does reflect a certain lack of faith in the voters. Mm-hmm. But aren't unlimited terms the hallmark of so many countries that are, quite frankly, democratic in name only, but really are authoritarian? Well, yes, but I, I think the, the simple retort to that is those countries don't have all of the other constitutional rules and protections that we have. Look, if we didn't have the first 10 amendments to the Constitution and we didn't have the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, you know, the due process and, you know, equal rights under the law and, and voting rights, well, then I'd be, I'd be concerned, right? But we do have all of those things. So I think, you know, the, the comparison to a lot of these other countries is quite invidious. It is true that when Saddam Hussein was in power, every time he ran, he got 99% of the vote, right? But it seems to me that's a pretty specious argument against term limits here, because unlike Hussein's Iraq, we have an entire body of voting law and civil rights law that allows us free and fair elections, and none of that would change. Now, you say a term limit automatically renders a president powerless because opponents in both parties have nothing to fear from him or her. But couldn't a lame duck or president re- their power? Not, I, I wouldn't say powerless, but inhibits their power. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But but then again, couldn't a lame duck president reverse his or her campaign promises or or run wild because there is no prospect of reelection? We haven't seen that necessarily, but well, you know, I actually would argue that in with Bush Jr. we kind of did. And that was the point I tried to make in an earlier piece about Bush, where I was arguing that he, too, should be allowed to run for uh, for re-election. This would be in 2006, around the time that the Iraq study group uh, released this report about our Iraq policy and, frankly, how wrong-headed it was. And Bush ignored it openly um, and and said, quote, you know, I'm going to sleep soundly at night. And the point I tried to make in that piece is that if he wasn't a lame duck— um, if he was facing re-election or the prospect of it, that maybe he wouldn't sleep so soundly. Um, so I think that's another really powerful argument against term limits is in some ways it takes away what um, Governor Morris of New York at the Constitutional Convention called um, the reason for good behavior. Um, uh, that, that, that is, it, 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 it takes away an incentive to, well, um, uh, persuade the voters um, and and act in accord with their will. Hmm. 
We're speaking with Jonathan Zimmerman, professor of education and history and director of the History of Education program at New York University, talking about the piece that he recently wrote, a widely circulated op-ed calling for an end to the two-term limit for presidents. So why are term limits then so popular that 36 states have them for their governors? Or is this a different animal altogether when you're talking about it at the state level? I think it is. I mean, I think there are, you know, both both at the state and at the congressional levels, I think there's a lot of evidence that, A, the power of incumbency is greater. You know, let's remember that a lot of our recent presidents who sought reelection, including, you know, Ford, Carter and, and Bush Sr., didn't get it. Um, uh, and 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 with respect to the popularity of these measures, look, the 22nd Amendment is popular as well. I'm in the minority here. There's no question about it. And there have been surveys done on the on the question, and three quarters of of Americans believe in the Twenty Second Amendment and believe that the president should be term limited. So, um, uh, that's going to continue until well, our views change. And I, I I would say that the popularity of term limits, I think, in some ways, reflects a kind of pessimism on the part of the American people, in frankly themselves in their ability to reason, judge, deliberate, and to throw the bums out when they're not doing what the people have asked them to do. Um, uh, I think we're at a really, really difficult moment in our democracy. And there's a huge amount of um, cynicism, passivity, apathy, um, and pessimism about our own abilities to govern ourselves. And I think term limits are part of that pessimism. If members of Congress can serve an unlimited number of terms, doesn't that put them at a great advantage, at great advantage collectively over any president? Uh, well, I think it does. Um, and there is, I mean, I think what you're pointing to is a very interesting disconnect or, um, uh, or difference, right, between the way now we govern uh, elections in the executive and legislative branches, right? The president's term limited, but the Congress people, they get to stay as long as they can get the votes. And I do think that's another way that actually we hamper presidents unfairly. You know, um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that in their second terms, presidents have lost a lot of power. Now, in fairness, to the, the, the other side of the argument here, term limits are not the only reason for that. You know, we all know that, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of exhaustion and ennui that sets in. We know that there are often a lot of turnovers at the cabinet level, which creates all kinds of instabilities and inefficiencies. So there have often been scandals in the second term. I want to be clear that term limits aren't the only reason that second term presidents tend to have less power, but surely they're one of the reasons. It also certainly changes the the outlook on the presidential election cycle. I mean, w- would we be talking about Hillary or whoever it's going to be the next time around right now if, in fact, this current president w- was able to run again if he so choose, chose? Right. Well, I mean, again, we don't know, and I think that's precisely the problem. We should know, right? That is, we should be able to test all of these things. I mean, one way of thinking about term limits is it just – removes options from us, right, and, and, and prevents us from asking and addressing questions precisely like the one you raised. We're speaking with Jonathan Zimmerman, professor of education and history, director of the History of Education program at New York University. So this argument over presidential term limits has been going on a long time. Uh, doesn't it really boil down to political considerations? For example, when Republicans wanted the Constitution changed to allow Reagan to keep serving and Democrats wanted a third term for Clinton? Um, You know, it does. It does depend on whose ox is being gored. There's no question about it. Um, But I do think that we should all remind ourselves that, you know, as soon as the Republicans won the amendment, they started questioning it themselves. And the reason to go back to your question is that is that their man was a power, Eisenhower, you know, and, and he was a great vote getter and a very popular leader. Um, and and I think all of us should ask ourselves, um, if there's a chief executive whom we really admire, who we think is doing an absolutely terrific job, why shouldn't we be allowed 
as a community, as a political community, to keep that person in office. Why tie our hands behind our back? I do think eventually the amendment will be challenged and changed. Uh, And it will be challenged and changed when we have a tremendously popular and effective second-term American president. I think enough Americans on both sides of the aisle will say, now hold on, things are going great with this guy or gal, and now, because of some prima facie rule, we have to get somebody else? It just doesn't make sense. Then again, the likelihood of, because of what we have set up already, though, because of these term limits, then, will we ever get that? Because, you know, we, we always talk about a second term president as being lame duck, and especially those last two years, eh, he can't really do anything anyway, let's not worry about him. So, I mean, c- can we ever achieve that, that second term president that's extremely popular and, and productive? Again, you know, I think that we will. At, at, um, I, I, it may take some time. Right. The future is a whole set of question marks. But, you know, American politics has surprised us before. Um, So stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Jonathan Zimmerman, professor of education and history and director of the history of education program at New York University. Thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We enjoyed your time and hopefully we can do this again soon. Yeah, I'd like that. It was fun. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press and his guest, Congressman Stephen Horsford. And we are joined by one of the members of the House who was there in the chamber last night with President Obama, a freshman member of the House from the state of Nevada, Congressman uh, Stephen Horsford. Congressman, nice to meet you and great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Bill. Great to be on your show. How's Thank Congress you. so far? Huh? Congress is great. You know, this is a great honor and a privilege to serve the people of Nevada's 4th Congressional District. Uh, I uh, count it as an honor and a blessing every day uh, to have the opportunity to serve as their representative. And last night was one of those nights that reminded me uh, just how grateful I am that the people of Nevada Uh, elected me to serve them as their representative. What I want you to know, I consider it an honor to visit Las Vegas, too, (laughs) uh, Congressman. I'm going to be out there um, early March for a couple of days and uh, looking forward to it. Have a great time, and don't worry. Whatever you lose, 50% of that goes to public education in Nevada. (laughs) So (laughs) so bad about it now. I'm just going out there to help the children. Right. (laughs) You know? And is it really true that uh, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas? It, 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 it's a uh, slogan that has gotten us 40 million visitors a year and uh, <laughs> counting. So uh, it's a great brand. Uh, you know, we are a great place uh, to come and enjoy uh, a, a personal vacation, to have a convention. And our economy is yeah. on the rebound. We're still, you know, not where we want to be. Our, we still have high unemployment. Uh, but in the gaming tourism sector, uh, things are coming back. So come and see all the new attractions that Las Vegas has to offer. All right, I'll do my best. I'll spend <laughs> as much as I, as much as I can in two in, in two days. So, um, what do you think? The president delivered last night. The president absolutely delivered. Uh, he delivered on uh, a focus around an economic agenda for the middle class uh, and to remind people uh, that the workforce has changed and continues to change. Uh, Women now make up 50 percent of the workforce, um, and yet they're not receiving equal pay for equal work. And as the president said in 2014, that's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And we do have legislation. That was a very powerful part of the speech last night. It was. It was for me, and I think it it is for the millions of Americans, um, of women in America who are getting paid 77 cents for every uh, dollar that a man gets paid uh, f- for doing the same work. Yeah. Let's just take a Here's the president last night on that point. That is wrong. And in 
2014, it's an embarrassment. Women deserve equal pay for equal work. Yeah, that was very, and he really brought people to the feet with that. At least the Democrats to the feet with that last night. I was saying earlier, uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLaro, whom you know, of course, is a, lives on the Hill, and she's frequent guest here in the studio. She was up on her feet last night, oh, leading yeah. the cheers. She was really great. Yeah. Well, it's the when women succeed, America succeeds. Absolutely. Agenda uh, that the House Democrats have outlined. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor on a number of key bills with representatives uh, like uh, my good friend and colleague. Uh, Congresswoman Delero, because it's the right thing to do for uh, women, for families, and for the uh, American economy. More than 40 percent of the households in America now are uh, led by women. And uh, when they are earning more, uh, that helps them provide for themselves and their family. And in uh, households like mine, where my wife works, uh, her making more helps our family uh, sure. be able to meet our obligations. And so this is the right thing to do. The fact that Democrats uh, have been calling for this and yet Speaker Boehner and the House Republicans refuse to bring forward a bill in 2014 to ensure that women can get paid the same as men is unconscionable to me. Right. So uh, I I was surprised. I thought, I think we saw a kind of a feisty Barack Obama last night that we haven't always seen, which I loved, you know, and a couple of times when he really sort of got in their face. And the one time where he talked about on the Affordable Care Act again, here's a quick clip where where the president said, here's what we don't need. If you have specific plans to cut costs, cover more people, increase choice, tell America what you do differently. Let's see if the numbers add up. That was a good point. I like But that. let's not have another 40-something votes <laughs> to repeal a law that's already helping millions of Americans like Amanda. This is bad. Yeah. Now, of course, John Boehner did not stand up and applaud at that line. But it's true. I mean, they're just wasting their time thinking Obamacare is going to go away. Right. We had another one this week uh, around <laughs> uh, abortion uh, rights oh, right. and, and the effect uh, of that issue on the Affordable Care Act. It, it's nonsensical that when, when a bill that provides uh, a guarantee that if you have a pre-existing condition that you will no longer be denied insurance in this country, uh, a bill that uh, ensures that companies, insurance companies, can no longer cap your mm-hmm. uh, medical cost uh, despite or, the illnesses or, that you may have. Right, or drop you because of... Yeah. Or drop you. And another uh, issue that affects women... Uh, women were being Especially. discriminated against, paying higher rates simply because of their gender. Those all have ended now under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I am one of those who want to work to make the uh, Affordable Care Act work better. Uh, you know, in mm-hmm. my state, there are challenges uh, with the implementation, uh, but we want to work together to make it work, not 40 some votes to repeal, delay, or obstruct it. Um, and I have many, many constituents in the state of Nevada who are getting health care for the first time. Our state has over 21 percent of our population is uninsured. A third of them Whoa. are children. Right. Uh, so with the expansion of Medicaid and the opportunity to now buy private insurance, uh, it's a great opportunity for a lot of Americans. Uh, did the president do the right thing by... Um Raising the minimum wage for federal workers by executive action. I mean, there, you know, some of the Republicans were complaining. Oh no, executive order. We got the Constitution, man. You know, it's our job to pass the bills. It's not his his job to sign them. Right? No. Well, look. No matter what the president does, they, they complain when he wakes up in the morning uh, <laughs> because no matter what he does, they have a criticism for it. Meanwhile, uh, the House Republicans are the do nothing Congress. They have accomplished nothing. Uh, under their majority, except to obst- obstruct the president. And what he said is, I'm willing to work with you. And and I do agree. Uh, increasing the federal minimum wage to $10.10 is the right thing to do. Uh, in my home state of Nevada, our minimum wage is a dollar more than whatever the federal minimum is wage is yeah. with yeah. the cost of a CPI for inflation. Uh, so we recognize that the uh, you have to pay people a living wage. And $7.25 uh, at a time when CEOs are making record profits, companies have more money on their balance sheets than ever before, they can afford to pay their workers more to lift them out of poverty 
so that they're not as reliant on government programs. If Republicans really believe their rhetoric, then let's pay American workers a, 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 a fair and decent wage so that they don't have to live in poverty and rely on the social safety net programs uh, that are there. But here's what I don't understand. Some of those, you know, you've got those people in your district, Congressman. I don't care whether they're Tea Party Republicans or not. There are a lot of these people who are trying, struggling to get by on the minimum wage, working a full-time job and yet living in poverty. Those people are also in Republican districts, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, and when President Obama last night said, I, I had made a, no, a, a, a note in my, in my own watching the speech. Mm -hmm. He said, let's give America a raise. And John Boehner doesn't even applaud you. I mean, how can you be, how can you be against that? I don't get it. Right. Again, their constituents need it as much as yours do. Everybody uh, deserves a raise. America deserves a raise. And I agree it's time to give America a raise. What's astonishing, as you said, is they have no problem with corporate success, with CEO success, f success for the top 1%. They'll applaud and say that that is very much a part of the American dream. And I have nothing against successful people. But we also need to have a, an American economic agenda that's focused on the middle class, who are the true engines of our economy, uh, the ones who are the consumers and that uh, 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 allow our economy to, to, to thrive. And that's really what the president's message was all about. I thought the most uh, effective line of the night was when he said, you are either helping mm -hmm. or hindering yeah. the progress of America. And there are a lot of Republicans, particularly the Tea Party ideologues, who are hindering America's progress. They came here for that purpose. They're, I mean, they, they almost are upfront about it. Yeah, they don't want anything to happen. The best of uh, Nevada, the best of Las Vegas, Harry Reid and Stephen Horsford, not Sheldon Adelson. Forget him. We don't want him around <laughs> at all. Uh, but uh, the good congressman here in studio with us. Ready to uh, take your calls. We'll continue to talk about the State of the Union. You watched it. What did you think? Did you hear everything you were hoping to hear from this president? He, I thought, was very powerful, very upbeat, very strong, progressive agenda he laid out last night. 866-55-PRESS is the toll-free number. We'll be right back. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV. This is the Bill Press Show. Here we go at 13 minutes, be 12 minutes now, make it before the top of the hour. Congressman Dan Kildee from Michigan will join us at the top of the hour together with a Jamal Simmons, Democratic strategist. Um, Congressman Kildee's colleague, uh, Stephen Horsford, Congressman from Nevada, from Nevada's 4th District, here in the studio with us now again, Congressman. Great to have, great to have you here. Thanks, um, everybody, uh, member of Congress, they get to. There's not a lot of room in that chamber. I mean, on the floor, everybody's crowded in, and then in the galleries, there's, there's not a lot of room. So every member of Congress gets one to invite one guest. Um, your guest last night, except for the president. The president, obviously, <laughs> he, 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 he had some uh, some wonderful, wonderful people in there with the first lady last night. Who did you invite? I invited a constituent uh, from Nevada, an out-of-work uh, constituent. Uh, her name is Tamika Woods. Uh, she is an electrical worker uh, with the IBEW in mm -hmm. Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, the high unemployment in the construction sector, uh, working with uh, Congressman Levin, uh, several colleagues and I uh, brought constituents from our home states who've been affected by the loss of unemployment insurance benefits uh, to kind of bring a voice and a perspective and a face to the 1.6 million Americans, 1.7 now if Congress doesn't act this week, um, who are now, uh, who've now lost their unemployment insurance benefits because of the failure of Congress uh, to act to extend those vital uh, bridges till people can get back on their feet. Uh, it's too bad the president can't do that by executive order, right? You know? Well, again, this is one I of mean, these. Just, again, the, some of the, those people, some of those people are in Republican Tea Party districts. Unemployment workers, uh, unemployment people are everywhere uh, in every district yeah. across America, rural or urban, uh, blue or red. 
purple mm-hmm. districts like mine uh, and everything in between, uh, people um, are unemployed and they need their Congress to act on their behalf. This is the first time in decades uh, that Congress has has not acted to extend uninsurance uh, benefits. In my home state of Nevada, 20,000 people now have lost uninsurance benefits. And as Tamika told me, she's an electrical worker. Mm-hmm. Okay, She's used to working. Yeah. She's been in the trade for 13 years. She, she's a nontraditional uh, person in the trade, uh, uh, a woman in the trade who went through the program through apprenticeship, uh, which the president talked a little bit about last night. Um, she wants to work. But right now, in Las Vegas, at least, the construction jobs simply are not there at the level they were. She told me before they used to send out two to 300 people a day for jobs. Whoa. Now they're sending six to seven people out a day hmm. based on what's available. That's no fault of her uh, or her or her co-workers. It's just a reality of the industry uh, in the construction sector but in Nevada. But it's so important, to, as you say, to put faces on these people so the people get to know them and hear their stories, and, and, and which belies this Republican comments that these are just lazy, good-for-nothings who take their unemployment check and, and then don't go look for a job. Just, just the opposite. And when you uh, hear that story, it really drives home just how silly it is when people bring reality TV show stars like Duck Dynasty oh, yeah. to the yeah. State of the Union when like this is the face of someone who really needs to hear what the president has to say. You could really point out to the president, here's someone that needs your help, as opposed to a millionaire who is on television. Yeah. Don't, I mean, don't, don't, please, don't let them turn the State of the Union into another White House Correspondents' Dinner where you <laughs> invite your silliest celebrity. Uh, Congressman, a lot of callers, if we can say hello to, uh, here's Mike from Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Hi, Mike. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Congressman. Uh, great job, guys. Just real quick, I just I love this speech. My father taught me something. God bless his soul. I miss him so much. Have the courage of your convictions. And I believe our president has the courage of his convictions. I think he showed that last night, Mike. Yes, sir. A, yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. That's thank an you. excellent comment. He was really, uh, Congressman, he was so upbeat last night, right? And I said, say a couple of times, he just got in their face, right? Uh, come on, let's not waste time with another 44 repeal votes. Right? Well, uh, we do know where the president stands. We know where the majority of uh, those of us uh, in the House Democratic Caucus stand and the Senate Democrats stand. We stand with the American people and the middle class who are struggling uh, to survive. People are on the brink right now. And the president talked about that. He talked about the need to have economic policies that are focused on them, and he is ready to fight for it. And I am glad that he said uh, that he will work with Congress around these issues. But where Congress fails to act, that he will use the power of his pen and his phone to get things done that he has the authority to get done. And uh, you know, if the Congress fails to act, we need someone to act because that ultimately is what the American people expect is action from their government. All right. Congress, do you have a uh, website? Please visit me, uh, stephenhorsford.com, uh, Twitter uh, at, at Rep Horsford. Okay. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. No, I'm glad you came in. Uh, as a rising young star in the Congress here. So check out the website and keep in touch with him. And uh, you've only been there a year, but you already have a re-election this uh, year, don't you? There, there's always a re-election, but I'm, <laughs> I'm focused on uh, the people, serving the people of Nevada's 4th. I'm honored to be here. We have a lot of work to do, uh, but we're going to keep fighting. And as that last caller just said, hold to our convictions, the core values of what we stand for, and that's all about people. All right, you got it. Hey, Congressman, so good to meet you. Thanks for coming in. We'll see you again soon. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Dante Chinney, Jonathan Zimmerman, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. 
Go to America's 